Hello, everybody. It's great to see everybody. You know, um, I'll be talking about carving and texturing on wood turnings. And for the longest time, I, I didn't do much of it. Uh, you know, I, I generally look for, you know, blanks with nice grain. Um, and then I, I try to get beautiful form from it. But after a while, you do, you find yourself um, thinking about maybe doing even simple things like a, an inset bead, breaking up what could be a pretty stark form by adding something. And then eventually I did, I did that. Of course, you do a lot of that on the lathe. You don't have to necessarily do it outside of the lathe. Um, but I, it was funny because I went, years ago, um, we did a, um, an artist studio and I actually brought my lathe down to a, a glass artist friend of mine. Hmm. And she introduced me as somebody who uses a lathe to carve wood. And I was going to correct her, but then I realized there isn't much to correct because, in essence, you know, if you're if you're applying a sharp tool to a, whether it's stationary or moving, you are carving wood. So I think the process of wood turning in and of itself is carving. So um, I'm gonna I actually put together an eight minute video. I'm, I'll probably pause it um, as it moves um, and maybe make some comments as I go along. If you have any questions, it's probably I'm thinking it's probably best at the end. Um, and maybe I'll answer your questions as I pause the video. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and try to. A large percentage of the carving and texturing I do occurs with the work mounted and the lathe running. Here I'm using a three point tool. So the Alan had mentioned this three point tool and I thought some people call it the pyramid tool. And it's really a great tool. And for those of you who don't have one, um, they're pretty simple to make. And there's, you could either buy a piece of high speed steel or even carbon steel for that matter, or, or high carbon steel and make your own. But um, if for anybody who's interested, and I think almost everybody in my Monday class would, did want to make one, let me know and I can share how to make it and uh, where to get some source, some of the supplies for it. That would be great, Joe. I could even, you know, put that in our next, uh, you know, meeting minutes or whatever. Oh, great. Okay. Um, and making a series of light cuts across a broad rim. Using the same three-point tool, here I am just putting the point in a little deeper and in essence making a series of simple V grooves along a broad rim. From those grooves using the three-point tool, it's very easy then to form nicely shaped beads. Um, the three-point tool is very effective at doing this. Of course, a spear point tool is also similar. And there's many other ways of making beads on face grain and end grain, but I found this is a simple way. Point goes in. So I'm gonna explain how the point goes in and, and you move the handle and it sort of pivots right at the, at the tool rest. And in the same time, you're rotating it a little bit. And that's what helps create that, takes that sharp edged um, groove and makes it round. And you do the one side and then the other. So it is, I think, a, a very easy way to, to, um, to make the beads. And it leaves, you know, reasonably good finish, even on the end grain portion of a face grain turning. And, and this handle swung and um, you form the left and right side of the bead. Here I'm using the double bevel cutter on um, the Sorby brand of texturing tool. Other manufacturers make similar tools. And I'm just moving that um, double bevel cutter uh, laterally across the tool rest and that creates what a lot of people call orange peel, but it's a, a pleasing texture. I think of this almost as embossing. Again, um, using the Sorby tool, in this case now, I've turned the RPM down a little lower. And on an angle, I'm using a single bevel um, cutter. And I'm making a series of um, cuts and I'm changing the direction and the incline of that angle. And that'll create a series of cuts. Sometimes it's very random. It could be frustrating using that tool. But with practice, uh, you do start to get some nice results. And now again, going back to the three point tool, I'm making some V grooves and that helps define 
those cuts. So that that's this, the miniature Sorby tool that I was using and the diameter of that cutter. And it comes with three cutters, the, the single bevel cutter that helps form these, um, these type, type of uh, cuts. And then the other that kind of creates a texture like that orange peel earlier. And all, the Sorby and I think Crown makes the other, they also sell a larger version and they both come with stages or a piece of metal that have the ability for you to lock in at a particular angle. And I think one of the frustrating things about using those is that if the, if you think about it, it's like a toothed wheel and depending on the diameter that you're cutting, if you don't have it right where it needs to be for that one tooth to fall in to the, to the next uh, revolution, you end up chewing the wood up. Mm. So what I, what I realize, and we, we, again, if anybody's interested, just let me contact me individually. If they have trouble using it or are interested in trying it, again, it can be very frustrating. What I find, I, I don't even bother with that stage or that incline plate. Uh, because you, depending on the on the diameter, and you really can't keep a record of what diameter, because with even here with this slightly enlarged open form, it changes, and um, depending on. But what I have found is that you almost let the um, cutter find its way into that groove, and it'll actually kick, and then you listen to the sound, and you'll get a good sense of um, of whether or not you're chewing the wood up or if it's falling into the right pattern. To repeat itself, if that makes sense. Nick Agar is the expert uh, using this. Um, Carl Ford has also, um, if not mastered it, because I don't know if anybody masters it, even Nick Agar, you have to be ready for some random results with it. But it is fun to use and it, hey, it makes a pattern relative very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it took a long time to make. So, and, so Joe, you cut those grooves after you textured. I've seen people do the reverse. Um, is that just personal preference? Yeah, no, you know, it depends. I, I, there's times when I do it the other way too. And, and I guess overall, whenever you're talking about carving, you should have some pre-planning. And I, I could talk about that after this video, because I really don't address it um, in the video. But okay. yeah, you do have to have some pre-planning regarding, um, or you could just kind of, uh, in the process of making this video, I mean, I kept screwing up, so I would just, that, that rim was much wider in terms of that uh, raised area from the other bowl. And, you know, every time I screwed up, I would just sweep across. <laughs> so again, you have to be kind of random. And, um, but when you, when you actually want to do a carved piece and you have an idea, of course, drawings, and I guess a lot of ideas that we talked about uh, at that last time about design comes into play. But no, as far as the, these defining, I usually do the patterns first because sometimes it'll kick and you don't know exactly where it'll go. Yeah, it makes sense. Here I'm using a long nose spindle gouge. And this is a method that a lot of professional wood turners would use to create beads on bowls. And um, it was taught to me by Richard Raffin who popularized it. The technique is a little not intuitive, but with practice, it, it makes it uh, very easy. And it, the advantage of this is that it leaves very little um, torn grain on the end grain section of a bowl and um, it's again you start with the flute closed and as you bring the nose up it forms one half of the bead and then when you bring it down you form the other half. Carl Ford showed me this following technique using a scraper. Um, he learned it from Al Sturt and it's a great way to make large wide grooves in face I keep saying grooves. I don't know why. It, I, I guess they are grooves in essence, but I think a better way you could call these coves. And if anybody wants to practice that that earlier bead making thing, um, that's that that is interesting. And it's one of those things. Once you get the hang of it, you, you know it. It you, you'll pick it up pretty quick. Green, especially, and it has a large burr on it. And you notice that it's angled high, so it's a high shearing angle and you kind of use a scooping action and it creates these really nice large wide grooves with very little torn grain. In most cases, when people think carving, they're thinking uh, tools like this, hand tools. In this case, it's a V parting tool. Of course, it could also be a U-shaped gouge. 
And uh, the process is, even with the very sharpest, and, and these are well-maintained and well-made tools, but it's uh, not easy to do. Using a power reciprocating carver uh, allows you to get uh, that very nice clean cut with a lot less effort. But very often I find that um, using a rotary carver, a uh, simple tool like a Dremel, in this case, it's a shafted tool with a rotary cutter is the best way to go. Makes pretty short work of making those V grooves. The downside is though, very often you'll get a lot of fuzz, at least on one side of the cut. Yeah, so let me explain that. I, you know, with the, with the Carver's V parting tool, you know, such a sharp razor edged tool. And, and just because of the way you're cutting the fibers, you know, you're, you're not getting any, you shouldn't get any raised uh, uh, grain if it's properly sharpened. You might get a little fiber tear out once you reach the top, in this case, of the very top of that rim. But you each side of that V should be nice and clean. So now, of course, with this rotary cutter, as most of you know this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyhow, one half of its, uh, the fibers are being laid down as it's being cut, and the other side of that V groove is, um, is raising uh, the fibers. Um, so that is the problem with the rotary carver. If it's very sharp, and depending on the grain, depending on where on the bowl you're, you're turning, it could be you know, really um, uh, annoying kind of amount of tear out or fuzz, but you know, it's pretty easily taken care of. Oh, and the other thing, you know, the, a lot of these cutters um, are, are at 90 degrees. So you have to, if you want a V cut, you're, you're, you're angling it in to make the cut. Right, you're not you're not going broad. You have to angle it, and then you'll see right away how you have to maintain that angle to get that V cut. Mm -hmm. But the rotary cutters are something that's really worthwhile, and they come in a large variety. Um, these happen to be solid carbide cutters, and uh, there's some that have cut three grooves at once, single grooves. In this case, this is a actual carbide cup cutter. So I thought it would be helpful if I showed the process by which I use um, simple tools, most of which you probably already own, and inexpensive accessories to actually make a, you know, a carved and uh, embellished uh, platter in this case. So here you see I formed a bowl and a raised uh, beak, and I'm using a spear point tool to define a narrow area next to that bead. So there you go. In this case, I, I defined the area. For me, purchasing the Trent Bosch carving stand was definitely a game changer. Here I have it mounted on my outside bench. The beauty of it is your work is now uh, stuck in the four jaw chuck, which is a great place for it in case it needs to get back on the lathe. So here I'm using an angle grinder, uh, fitted with a coarse sanding flap wheel. And by using the corner of that wheel, I'm able to make these deep V grooves in the outer rim. So this is a really cool, um, this is a flap sander. I don't know if any of you, um, you've probably seen various things on angle grinders, um, but this is really cool. This is a 40 grit. And again, I'm just using the corner and I'm trying to angle it so that the V is pretty uh, symmetrical in the, in the face of where it is that I'm applying it. One of the things that's cool about that, uh, you know, I have it here. Because on a lot of your accessories for angle grinders, including the metal cutting and the ceramic cutting um, cutters, you have to use the, the washers and then the nut that ties it. The, in this case, I don't know if you can see me on, on, on camera, but there, there's an actual thread in the hub of this. So you don't need the washers. This actually screws right onto that threaded spindle of an angle grinder. But they, they cost about 10 bucks. They're not cheap. But uh, it's, a, it's a great way. It's a, and, and a lot of us already have angle grinders, so it's... Pretty inexpensive way to get into like larger carving. Again, the advantage of having the work mounted on your four jaw chuck allows me to put it back on the lathe. And in this case, now I've just decided I wanted to make some radial lines using the tool rest as a guide, and that'll help me guide the next cuts. So now, just using a standard Dremel cutter, it's like a four dollar cutter, it's the 115. 
and my Dremel tool. And again, the Dremel tool is, uh, you know, maybe a $35 two-speed Dremel tool. And notice I, I keep my uh, fingers, um, thumb and forefinger around that narrow portion of the cutter, of the Dremel. And I rest it on the work. And I'm using those earlier made lines that radiate out from the center. And I'm just gonna continue around and I'm trying to maintain that angle so that these make V cuts. Of course, again, very often, depending on where in the grain, you'll get a lot of fuzz and tear out. So in this case, I'm just using a, a drill mounted wire wheel and keeping in that same radial direction, I'm using it to smooth out and get rid of some of that tear out and fuzz. So here I'm using a wire wheel. There's so many different types of uh, um, why uh, wheels like that they're impregnated with abrasives so um, I, I would say though um, Carl Ford does a lot of the carving he had learned a lot from Al Sturt and he's certainly learned a lot since he's taken classes with him and his his blog will talk a lot about some of the sources for all these various types of uh, abrasives that that could help you you know get rid of some of the uh, so, but a, a wire wheel actually works very well Oh, you know, when I first showed that um, the point tool making very tight series of, of cuts to create a, more of a texture and a bunch of those little grooves. For the longest time, I used to use a wire wheel on the drill to try to create that texture. Um, and, and again, um, John Jordan showed Carl, <coughs> and that is you hold it, you hold the wire wheels in your hands, gloved hands, of course. And you let the, the rotating piece go up against the wheel. And that, that leaves a really, even on, a, you know, relatively dense wood like this cherry. Um, maple would leave pretty nice um, finish also. Um, very, very exotic hardwood, you're not going to get as much. But uh, yeah, don't, don't do what I had done for years, trying to create that texture with a wire wheel on a drill. It doesn't work anywhere near. I don't think you can get the force that you need. You literally have to really press it in. And what you do... What I, what I, again, John Jordan um, says this, you put it in your drill and you, you know, of course with a full face shield, you sharpen the edges of the wire wheel by running it against a full face of a um, standard grinding wheel. So, you know, so that's how you sharpen the, uh, the individual wires. Any questions at this point? So I'll go right ahead. Up till now, most of the carbon has been pretty bold and I decided I wanted to do something much more delicate around this narrow area. So I decided to use a burner and it's fitted with a nichrome wire coil that I made and it leaves a series of fine lines. And I went around in this direction first, then by turning the burner 90 degrees and applying the coil at pretty regular intervals, you could really create this nice basket weave effect I like the contrast between the deeply carved radial lines and the dark burned basket weave pattern, along with the smooth interior of the bowl. That's great, Joe. Beautiful. Yeah, Joe. yeah. great That's technique. Really helpful. Thanks, Thank you for putting that together. Oh yeah, you're very welcome. That was so, great. Thank so you. you made that the tip for the um, wood burning? Yes, yeah. So you buy the nichrome wire. Um, I believe that was a 18 or maybe the 20 gauge the number goes up it gets thinner and i just used it put it around a, maybe an eighth inch dowel wrapped it around um and then with that burn master um burner that i have it comes with the one i bought came with two two pens you can't run two pens at the same time but it's nice because you can you can mount two different types of burn uh burner tips on the uh, machine um and and that's it has it's 130 watt it's rated and for that size that gauge chrome nichrome wire you will in essence it's, that's really called branding more than um you know a lot of the tips are finer much thinner so you do need quite a lot of watts to get that particular coil hot enough and you i have, have to crank up a to, i'm sorry do you have to buy the ferrules to put the wire into the pen no not not the burn master pen the burn master pen um, as the razor tip pens are very, um, are, 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 the pen has the tip attached permanently. 
Um, but Burn Master and some other brands, um, you, you have these small receptacles that your nichrome wire fit into. And then you just tighten them up with a, with a screwdriver to make good contact. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's what I meant by ferrules. So, so you, you put that tips and that's what you then put into the pen or you're just basically feeding the nichrome, nichrome wire into the pen, into the pen. Oh, yeah. The pen, the pen has those two ferrule receptacles that you oh, built in. Yeah. So they're, they're interchangeable. It's an interchangeable tip pen, as opposed to some brands that the tip is permanently attached. Matter of fact, I, I forget what the prices are now. They've gone up, of course, like everything. But um, that that I think the Burn Master now is kind of the standard. Um, there's the Cub Writer that a lot of people use, um, including like Keith Tompkins, just to sign their name. That's like an eighty dollar, and it comes with a I believe a razor tip or something like a permanent tip pen. But um, Graham Priddle is kind of the guy who um, really pushed the branding idea, at least uh, from my you know from what I had seen. And he showed how to take a, um, an older battery charger. It's a 10 amp battery charger. It's 10 amp rated for 12 volt. And um, the newer ones, you can't do it because there's like overload protections. Probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, but in essence, you're shorting out this, this wire that can handle that kind of resistance on high heat. And um, it's, it still holds, it has enough structure that you can now essentially brand or stamp with it. But of course, the other parts of the pen, you know, you could use all sorts of shading tips. Um, but you could use a ball um, write for writing. And uh, Julianne, maybe sometime, you know, when uh, it seems that you have beautiful, get beautiful results from the, from the engraver. I never have. I've never been able to get that. That's why I asked you about how you form the tip. Um, but, you know, that's, a, that's an avenue where you'd want to explore, you know, maybe at some point. Yeah. Learning. Well, I love that basket weave pattern that you did, yeah. but um, Mom Newton is the woman who um, really has beautiful, um, beautiful work, and she does a lot. Well, she does a lot of carving across the board, but she does. Wait, who did you say, Joe? What her was her name? name? Molly Molly Winton. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, I have seen her. So, so she, she does a lot of that, and you know, and then carving in general. I mean, I'm I'm far from any kind of an expert, but. Um, you know, I think um, Al Sturt, and I think he's still teaching classes, and he's up in somewhere up there in Vermont, Joe. Um, I think he's in really like real, real far up uh, next to the Canadian border. But I would, I, I still would like to take a class with him. Uh, he's, he's, he's incredible as far as the kind, the kind of carving that I like. And, um, and of course, you know, um, Trent Bosch himself does a lot of great carving, you know. And there's so many YouTube videos now that can help you um, start with this whole thing. But you know, I looked on, I looked on um, Home Depot site. I use this two, um, this two-speed Dremel. And and right now at Home Depot, and I think they'll ship it either to your store or to your house for free. It's thirty-five bucks. I mean, it was fifty, and it comes with a few. Um, most of the accessories are useless, but they have high-speed steel cutters. I think the one. There's two of them. There's the two speed Dremel, which is like a 1.15 amp. And then there's the variable speed Dremel. I think they want 60 bucks for that. So if you wanted the, the infinite variable speed, you spend another 25 bucks and you get that. It's a little heavier, but it is variable speed and it does have a little higher amp rating. Um, but for me, this is, this is fine. Um, Molly Witt and other um, carvers, if they, if they're not doing large work, they'll, they'll, use a it's called a micro motor carver and that hand piece is different um the hand piece itself has a very small motor and then the control is on a um like a desktop base um but i don't i i've tried i've i've used larger burrs with that and i think they're pretty well made carl thinks that that you would burn them out pretty fast um if you use the larger burrs with that but they're about 220 dollars those micro motor um, but but they are they, they, they have a beautiful feel. It's so much easier to change the burrs that, uh, in the body of the handpiece itself. You just mm -hmm. open it up and and it and it comes with different adapters for different diameter cutters. But to start, I would say um, with thirty five bucks, you can't go wrong uh, for mm -hmm. a Dremel, and you'll always mm -hmm. use a Dremel for something. Yeah. 
but don't do it for at home dentistry. Hey, Joe, <laughs> are you using uh, regular Dremel bits for that? Uh, for that carving, or did you get the special carbide uh, bits? For that, for that, I was I used their their one fifteen. Okay. Yeah, it's high speed. It dulls, you know, relatively quick. And then you can try Amazon for their carbide cutters. Don't get the real coarse ones. And good luck. Sometimes they run true. Sometimes they don't. Right. The, the most you're running is thirty five thousand RPM. But the shaft on those, um, I, I'm assuming they're coming from China. The shaft is not a full eighth inch. So I think uh, you're at the limits of the collet on the on the on the Dremel. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I have some that work beautifully, and um, I like using the inverted cone. So instead of having a straight sided, uh, the carbide cutter being straight sided, right. it has a very slight um, a taper down. Mm -hmm. And I just find that now instead of having a V that's ninety degrees, you're having it that's maybe seventy five or eighty. So it's just it's just a nicer, I think, not as bold of a V cut. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, thanks for putting that together. That thanks, Joe. Great. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Joe. You're very welcome, guys. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, you know, I, I did think about talking about pre planning, and Ed, I know you brought that up. So, depending on what you're going to do, um, I had some notes here, so let me just look at them. Um, oh, so. You know, listen, cutting. So you're either cutting with the with the use of the lathe or not. So I think those texture tools are cutting, but I also think of it like embossing. And the other thing you could use is um stamps, right? Or um, um, you know, some some way you could actually like a die. You could actually place it. Nick Agar does that a lot. He'll put something on, like even a uh, nail set, and he'll like punch, um, you know, around a certain you know interval. So I think of that as embossing, um, a braiding, of course, the flap discs, the burrs, the rotary cutters. The new rotary cutter, I haven't gotten it yet, but it's a great, it's a great cutter. It actually uses a small uh, cup cutter, um, like I, on some of the, some of the carb, it's a solid carbide cutter, and it's an actual cutting tool. And they put it on a very small rotary cutter, and there's three of them. Um, and they, they, they leave a beautiful finish. Um, a company called Mampa. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to waste everybody's time. If there's individual things, you, again, uh, Carl Ford, I, I don't know if you can uh, eat, get on his blog, but he has a lot of resources and there's a lot of other resources. But as far as getting some of the individual cutters, you know, spending 40, 50 bucks, you want to make sure it's something that people who use it a lot could recommend. And then, of course, burning. But in the case of sometimes, you know, you have to think about what you're going to do. If you're going to... Um, let's say use milk paint, which really reacts nicely to some woods like mahogany and cherry. The milk paint I, somehow reacts and, and gives it a really nice, um, the tannins I believe in the wood is what it reacts with. And it leaves a really nice bronze color, but you could paint it black and then, and then carve away. So obviously if you're gonna do that, you, know, you, need to, you need to lay the, you need to get the shape of the platter or the bowl down. And so this is an example of that type of thing. And here you obviously need a lot of pre-planning because you're, you're going to shape this exactly the way you want it. You're then going to paint it. And then in this case, I, I, I then formed uh, this ridge that helped define the rest of the carving. Now that you have the paint on it, it's an issue of you now removing the paint and the wood underneath is what gives you the contrast and shows the form. And then of course, I carved this with the reciprocating carver, but I then use a rotary carver in here. And of course a rotary carver with a ball cutter there. So here's where planning comes in, you know, yeah, obviously. Um, otherwise, if it's like a, and this is like an Al Sturt style um, bowl. In this case, I did all the cutting and the carving on the lathe and off, and then applied the milk paint and then removed it. And it gets this sort of nice rich brown kind of bronze color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is some planning involved depending on what it is you want to, what it is you want to do. So related to that, Joe, so I have a question. So there's a piece I've been working on and it is, I mean, it's a piece of beach and I burnt a um, maple leaf into it and I wanted to stain. I was originally going to carve the, the leaf so it was, you know, cut, but um, I decided the piece was too nice to do that. So if I put stain on and I want to get stain inside that burnt area, 
any tips, I mean, from you or from anyone else, actually, any tips on how to prevent bleed of that stain? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It depends on the, you know, the actual thickness of the stain you're using. It depends on the, the fibers could, you know, you know, depending on where they are, you know, just through capillary action, it could, it could jump that, that carved piece. Yeah, you that's what, that's what worries me. Yeah. You might want to consider maybe putting some kind of seal coat on the area where you don't want it to migrate to. Um, I, I, I don't do that kind of work, but those are the things I would imagine could create problems for you. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna use a seal coat on the outside, just as you suggested, to try and prevent that. But I don't want to end up with the with the bowl. I mean, because I want to use red and yellow and a little bit of you know blending to get the orange to get the leaf color. Right. Um, and I don't want to end up with a red bowl. <laughs> right. No, that's always an issue. No matter you know whether you're using CA glue to try to keep the natural edge on, you know you'll get you'll get that CA glue places where you don't want it. Um, but again, I don't have much experience with, with, um, paint running into areas you don't want it to run into. There's, um, actually Doug Waters was doing something. Alan, what was Doug doing where he needed to be concerned about, um, either a finish or something migrating into other areas? Do you remember that? I don't know if Alan's still there. I'm, I'm unmuting. I, I, I'm not sure I remember what you're referring to with Doug, but I, you'd have to do a test piece, but, um, I, you know, I, I, Certainly with paint, if you have a couple of coats of, of uh, you know, shellac seal coat um, and then you cut a groove, um, you should be in pretty good shape as far as paint is concerned. Stains and dyes penetrate a lot more deeply mm -hmm. than paint does. So, you know, you could test it and see how far it goes. The, the seal coat will prevent it on the surface, um, but whether you know the the, the the capillary action as joe mentions pulls it out underneath that seal coat that i don't know mm -hmm. you could contact jeff jewett at transtint uh he's like the go-to guy for uh for dyes oh. and uh that kind of finishing and he may be able to give you uh a good answer how do you spell his name david j-e-w-i Double T. Hey, Ed. Doesn't he run? Uh, I'm sorry, Julian. No, I was just wondering, Ed, how, how are you going to apply the dye? Because if it was through an airbrush or something, you could mask it off. And I mean, I've had luck with, you know, masking it off with the frisket or something and then spraying. As long as it's a lighter coat, I don't think that you'd have as much of a problem. Yeah, I, it's actually a trans tint dye that I, um, that I typically use. Um, and it would either be a brush or a um, or a rag to get the blending of the colors so that you actually, you know, so the piece looks natural. At least that was the intent. Okay. I think you need to invest a small fortune in airbrushing equipment. <laughs> for sure. Do you have uh, do you have stock in an airbrush company then? David? No, no, but I do have airbrush equipment, which I have yet to set up. <laughs> Steve, that's another thing you and I have in common. <laughs> I did take mine out of the box once, look at it, and then put it back in the box. <laughs> I've used it. Well, I've used the same oh. model at Carl's place because he's always all set up and ready to go and he's got you know 12 colors and each one has its own bottle and then i come home and i look at my box which isn't opened and i just keep it over there <laughs> well joe thanks again for putting together the video and for the uh, discussion tonight it was really uh, quite interesting Great. yeah yeah thanks joe thanks joe. terrific joe thank you thank you joe Thanks, Joe. Welcome. Thank you. We should think about making a challenge out of, a, you know, somebody having a carved piece. Maybe that's something you think in the future. Hmm. Yeah, we can talk about Great that idea. week, maybe for the uh, for January. Great. Sounds like the car. The challenge should be taking your airbrush out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm in as long as I don't have to use it. <laughs>